Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, December 3rd, 1945. It actually happened on December 4th, but we're doing it on December 3rd, 1945. The Senate approved the U.S. joining the U.N., The United States had entered World War II four years earlier after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. VE Day was marked in May of 1945. Japan surrendered in September of 1945. And here we are in December of 1945 with the U.S. deciding to join the United Nations. And that, listeners, is all you need to know about the history of World War II and what it took to get to this moment. Uh, But for real, the United Nations is, of course, a product of the end of World War II, but it also sets up decades and decades of collaboration among the world's countries, big and small. It was, in theory, the United States tying itself to the rest of the world in peace, not just in conflict. And here to discuss those very first days of the UN and how the U.S. decided to enter the organization is, as always, Nicole Hemmer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. Hello, Jody. Did you like my little summary of World War II there? Everything you need to know, right? I do. I feel like it's all you really need to know. Um, that's why the History Channel just repeats those words on a loop. Yeah, why watch all those long documentaries where you can just listen to my short intro and <laughs> know everything you need to know? Um, But look, here's where I want to start, because the last time we talked on this show about the United States deciding whether it wanted to enter into some big agreement with the rest of the world in the wake of a war, uh, we talked about how the Senate had rejected it, the United States deciding not to join the League of Nations after World War I. So I know this is a sort of silly question to phrase it this way, but um, what changed between the end of World War I and the end of World War II so that now the United States decides to get into one of these bigger coalitions? I mean, World War II happened. And that's that's pretty much it in a nutshell, um, in part because, you know, if you build an organization committed to uh, instilling a lasting peace and 20 years later, the entire world has devolved into arguably an even more catastrophic war, then something has gone terribly, terribly wrong. Right. And so just to put a finer point on it, it does seem like the failure of the League of Nations to prevent another war. And there were worries at the time that it was not going to be a strong enough alliance to to do that, to prevent another war. Um, I suppose one option for the United States is to say, hey, these big organizations, this big notion of all of us banding together, it doesn't work. Look what look what happened. Uh, It didn't prevent another world war. And the other is to double down and say, no, we're going to try and do it right this time. Yeah. I mean, I think that the problem with the first is what's your other option? You know, if you just say, okay, these big organizations don't work, let's go back to using the kinds of alliances that led to World War One. And then I think in the case of the United Nations, it was like, did we really give it our all with the League of Nations? And the United States had pretty much sat out of participation in the League of Nations. And so you were missing one major world power. It hadn't been imbued with enough powers um, and enough players to really keep the kind of peace that it wanted to keep. And so now that you've learned the lessons of the failure of the League of Nations, let's try it again, but let's try to learn something from those mistakes. I mean, it's a lot like the Articles of Confederation versus the Constitution. Um, One fails, you try again and try better. 
So when we talked about the League of Nations in our previous episode, for me, it was a really nice reminder of how much domestic politics is always such a huge factor in all of these stories. Um, even when we're talking about international coalitions, uh, you can have all these high minded ideals about America's place in the world. And often it just comes down to whether you can win over popular opinion in your country or wrangle votes in the Senate or so forth. So what is the domestic political context that we kind of have to keep in mind in order to understand why the U.S. decides to take this big step and join the United Nations. So I think people were pretty worried because what we had seen in the United States in those 20 years since the League of Nations had been rejected was that there was a pretty strong isolationist or non-interventionist impulse in the U.S., including deeply embedded in the Republican Party. And so you had the same kind of framework for failure that you had back in 1918, 1919. Um, but what happens is the Republican Party changes, in part because of World War II. Um, World War II made it clear that the United States could not stay out of these international conflicts. The fact that Japan had been able to attack the United States made that clear, that there was no way to be truly isolationist anymore. What was functionally the Senate minority leader, um, the Republican leader, Arthur Vandenberg, he himself had undergone a transformation during the yeah. war from a nationalist to an interventionist. And he led this Republican coalition so that the vote was nearly unanimous. Yeah. And I, and I just think so much about the kind of narrative factors here. I mean, you know, World War One, obviously incredibly complicated um, and morally maybe not as clear. World War Two, right. you know, it's a much clearer moral story. The United States given the way that the war shakes out, really has a much sort of greater sense of itself as the moral leader of the world. You know, we talked about how Wilson had a really hard time just sort of painting this picture of the United States as this moral leader. I think, I imagine, coming out of World War II, a lot more people just sort of see that vision um, because of the way the war played out. I mean, think about how we even talk about it today, like yeah. fighting the Nazis versus what, like fighting the Kaiser. It just doesn't have that sort of like moral resonance that World War II has. And at the time, that was even more deeply felt, I think, that the United States had fought. It had fought on the side of good, but also it had emerged at, as a leader of the world. I think it's really important to remember the context of the early 1940s. In 1941, you have the publication of Henry Luce's uh, essay, The American Century, where he's making the argument that the United States needs to claim leadership of the world. Um, you have the U.S. in a much more active role during the war and imagining a much more active internationalist future. Yeah, and then there are a few kind of other charters and other negotiations, even as the war is going on, that lead up to this moment. So you have the Atlantic Charter in 1942, which is not that long after the United States enters the war. Um, there's a declaration of the United Nations kind of as the war is still going on, and there's um, a sort of sense that we're going to establish this. Am I reading this wrong? Is that like a little presumptuous of, you know, the United States and other countries getting together and saying, okay, when we win this thing, then we'll be able to, to form this alliance? Well, look, I mean, after D-Day, the writing is on the wall. It's still, obviously, there is more than a year left of the war, but the tide has turned. And you have to start doing this planning, right? Yeah. Like, how are you going to handle this victory after all of these years of war, after all of this destruction? You have the Atlantic Charter, which lays out the ideas for a post-war war world um, that uh, the U.S. and the United Kingdom had joined into. Um, and there was also, again, this kind of concern about repeating what happened after World War I. Um, if you waited too long to introduce something like the United Nations, opposition in the U.S. could have built up much more significantly. But this all happens very rapidly after the end of the war. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about FDR's role in all of this. Um, he, of course, is you know a wartime president, but he, as you said, is starting to think through the establishment of of the United Nations. Um, one of my favorite tidbits is that early in the negotiations about what the UN would look like, Stalin asked for all 16 Soviet republics to be seated and Roosevelt countered by requesting that all 50 states be seated. Uh, <laughs> and then they bargained down and Stalin settled for three and the United States entered as a United States. Um, but, you know, these are the kind of little uh, nuts and bolts things you kind of have to go into as you're deciding how this is going to shake out. And this is all culminating in a conference in San Francisco in April of 1945, um, really as the war is winding down. And so the next phase is being negotiated. And Roosevelt dies a few days before the San Francisco conference. So I am kind of stunned by that fact simply because we've seen time and time again on this podcast, we've talked about it so much that when, you know, 
there's that vacuum of leadership, often because of illness or something else, um, things tend to fall apart. And the fact that this didn't fall apart when the president of the United States died three days before the conference to hammer out what the UN would look like is just kind of stunning to me. Yeah, you have to imagine that delegates were having flashbacks to World War One and the, the push for the League of Nations, because even before he died, Roosevelt had been quite ill. And so what we were just talking about, all that work that was being done before the end of the war turns out to be really, really important because there's so much momentum going into San Francisco. There are so many people who in the U.S. who are still sort of acting as bridges. So you have all these senators who are going to it. You have the members of the the Roosevelt administration who are participating. You have kind of an institutional continuity, even though the president has died. And you wonder if Roosevelt had learned something from what Wilson had gone through to make sure that everything was put in place, everything was lined up so that this had a momentum of its own going forward. And creating that momentum, was that about, as you just described, having senators and other people in in line to help push this forward? Or was it about kind of empowering Truman to then step in and just kind of pick up the baton and keep going? I mean, look, Roosevelt didn't think very highly or much of Truman, yeah. um, as we know. So I think that it was less focused on that and more just making sure that every gear was turning in the right direction going into this just to make sure that, you know, whatever contingency happened, that the U.S. was going to be able to push forward in this um, and that these other 50 nations that were present were going to be able to push forward toward the same goal. Um, What's your sense of Roosevelt's role in this in the way history looks at it? I mean, does does he get enough credit for the foundation of the U.N. or is it Truman who really has that notch in his belt? You know, it's interesting. I don't often think of Franklin Roosevelt and the United Nations together, because the United Nations is such a post-war institution. It's something that is much more closely associated with somebody like Dwight Eisenhower, who obviously oversaw um, the U.S.'s emergence into the world in the 1950s um, as a as a major world power. Um, so I think it's right of us to underscore the role that Roosevelt had played, particularly in the Atlantic Charter and in, in making all of this happen. But I think because he died, because he wasn't part of the post-war world, world. We just don't think of him as much when we think about the United Nations, even though he considered it, I think, one of his greatest accomplishments. Yeah. Um, so we have this San Francisco conference and uh, 50 different countries sent delegates there. Um, and they, again, started to hammer out some of the particulars. Um, one of my favorite tidbits is Truman really wanted the United States to be the first to ratify the charter. Nicaragua and El Salvador beat the U.S. to the punch and ratified it first. And um, I grew up in Latin America and Costa Rica, and I just know some some Nicaraguans and some Salvadorans, and this is a big point of pride for them. Uh, and I and I love that Nicaragua and El Salvador beat us to the punch there. But you know, as this gets ratified, I mean, it does feel like, as we were discussing when we started out, that it is finally the world stage is tilted a little bit towards the United States, and both in these high-minded ways, but even little things like. This conference took place in San Francisco. The UN headquarters was in New York. Uh, And so I just wonder kind of, you know, what other parts of the mechanics of this coming together signal this bigger shift? So I do think that the United States centrality to all of this shows us that the world was changing in pretty dramatic ways. I think intriguingly, you know, one of the other members of the Security Council was the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union, the UK and the US were all sort of grouped together as allies, as the the big three during World War II. But they didn't necessarily have a common cause outside of defeating the Nazis, right? So the tensions that will develop with the Cold War get routed through the UN. And so the United States primacy in the UN, I think, mattered. But it also made, at times, I would imagine the Soviet Union somewhat suspicious of the organization. Sure. And we see that play out over the course of the coming decades, for sure. Um, And I guess one tension that I've been thinking about and it again, reminds me a little bit of the conversation we had regarding the League of Nations, which is, you know, how much should we think of something like the United Nations as a a charter with all sorts of mechanics uh, built into it and allegiances where, you know, agreements that tie people to certain action when other action happens or so forth? And how much should we think of it at a much higher sort of more theoretical level of an idea? The United States and the rest of the world are all tied together and have common interests. And I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong here, but, you know, so much of what maybe scuttled 
the League of Nations was some of that minutia about treaties with regards to actions that would have to be taken if someone was attacked and so forth, whereas maybe the UN came off as a more high-minded project? So I think some of that is true, that the UN was the distillation of an idea. It, it, it involved um, more carve-outs that allowed for other alliances and things like that. So it, again, it had learned some things that had scuttled the League of Nations. But I don't want to undersell the amount of practical work sure. that it was doing. I mean, this wasn't necessarily super evident in 1945, but we're about to enter 20 to 30 years of radical decolonization all across the world. And the UN becomes a way in which those new countries come into a broader League of Nations and they get this kind of recognition that helps in some ways, at least at the margins, to ease the process of decolonization and the restructuring of the world that happens after World War II. So I think that it has some real functional things that it's doing that are worth thinking about. But the UN as an idea was a pretty powerful yeah. thing coming out of World War II. And notably, we should say, hasn't been another World War since. Yeah, there hasn't. I was I, I didn't get to that Wikipedia page, but there has not. You can con- <laughs> confirm. All right, let's leave uh, the UN and the US's entry into the UN there. And before we go, do a couple also on this days, because there are some interesting things that also happened on December 3rd. Um, so I'll read them, Nikki, if you have any Thoughts on them. Um, 1800, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr tie in the Electoral College. I will say that we have this um, big document with a bunch of dates coming up. And two weeks ago, we were looking ahead at the schedule and we saw, oh, this Electoral College tie between Aaron Burr and uh, Thomas Jefferson. Maybe that's going to be one that we're going to have to talk about. And, you know, that was a a darker timeline than the one we ended up on. Uh, But nevertheless, um, there have been Electoral College ties before. In 1800, there was this one. Any you know anything about that? Well, I do want to speak up for this timeline and say that it is plenty dark. Um, it is plenty dark, but, that's correct. Yes. Um, I mean, look, this has been obviously memorialized in the musical Hamilton, but it was a real test for the new constitution and the new nation. Like, you're supposed to have the first peaceful transfer of power. You're, you've got a bit of a problem here with this electoral college tie. And it also points out kind of the challenge of how elections work right away that has to get sorted out. And Fortunately, there were constitutional mechanisms for making that happen. Yeah. And then one other one that was just on our list, and I started to do a little research around it. Um, but in 1982, there was this incident in Times Beach, Missouri, where there was an incredible amount of toxic dioxins that were found in a town. And the town was shuttered and evacuated. And it actually was, I believe still closed today. Um, It's a really interesting story. I'm not summarizing it very well, but if you have a minute, just go check out the Wikipedia page for Times Beach, Missouri. It's a kind of, I would say, early interesting example of environmentalism and the role of the EPA and and all sorts of stuff. Um, But again, I would just advocate for spending a few minutes with the Wikipedia page on Times Beach, Missouri, which is a story I'd never heard of before. I haven't heard of it either. I'm definitely going down that rabbit hole. Um, Okay. Well, that's the end of the episode. Uh, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Radiotopia is an independent network of independent shows, artist-driven, and often listener-supported. So if you would like to support this show directly, you can do so at thisdaypod.com. There's a form there. You can give a one-time donation. You can become a recurring member. Um, Listener support is a big piece of the pie alongside ad revenue. And in general, if you want to do your part to help support this show, you can give, but you can also just help spread the word leave a rating or a review send us a note or just listen and we really do appreciate all the support from our listeners and this little community we have going our researcher and producer is jacob feldman our producer is Brittany brown if you have any questions or comments about the show you can find that form at thisdaypod.com or email us thisdaypod at gmail.com my name is jody avergan thanks again for listening and we'll see you soon